Hey everybody, it's Father Sean Kilcally back again for another installment of the Beatitudes and the 12 Steps. And today I'm talking about the second Beatitude and Step 2. And so the second Beatitude is, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And um, it really might be one of the hardest things to live in our daily lives. I know for me, grief is probably my least favorite emotion, but it might be my most frequently felt emotion at the same time, or the most frequently numbed out emotion at the same time. And, uh, and it's a necessary part of our recovery. It's a necessary part of the beginning early stages of recovery and and as our lord reveals in the beatitudes it's a necessary part of our the early stages of our conversion process and uh and so when we talk about grief there are the five stages of grief and and it might be helpful for for us who are in recovery to look at those five stages and and be really honest with ourselves about where we are right so denial uh denial might sound like yeah, I really don't think I need to go to a group or I don't I don't think I need to get help. I, I'm pretty sure I just have, you know, a discipline issue and uh, and I don't really need to do all of that other stuff. Right. Or it's not that bad or I'm only acting out, you know, I'm only really acting out every month or so. And so so I'm probably not an addict. Um, like we all have our own forms of denial. Right. Bargaining. And bargaining might look like, well, well, okay, so I'll, I'll kind of go to group, but I'm not going to get a sponsor, all right? So I, I'm going to be around these meetings, but I, I don't really want to go all in. Uh, maybe if I just like, you know, do do these few things, I don't have to do everything, all right? And and there's always a kind of bargaining that goes on in recovery, and a kind of bargaining that goes on in conversion. And sometimes people even argue with their sinfulness. And they might say something like, well, well, it's not that bad if I don't act out all the way. You know, I can look at something a little bit, but but as long as I don't go all the way, I'm okay. And we're bargaining. You know, anger is a commonly felt stage of grief. You know, when we get angry about the things that we have to do or we get angry about the time that we have to give up in order to work our recovery program. A lot of people get angry about the fact that you know, they have to spend so much time going to meetings and going to therapy in order to try to get better. You know, despair can set in where we really start to believe that we're never going to get better. You know, I'm never going to get better. And then finally, acceptance. You know, and acceptance is that stage in which we, we recognize that, you know, I do have an addiction and I have to live my life differently for the rest of my life. And there are certain things that can't be part of my life anymore. You know, acceptance is, okay, Lord, I'm going to give you control over my life. I'm not going to try to control my life anymore. You know, and that's where we start to experience real serenity, you know, real serenity. And there are certain things that have to be grieved in our lives. For many people who are caught up in addictions, their addiction has been their best friend. Their addiction has been their comforter. Their addiction is the thing that got them through their parents' divorce. Their addiction is the thing that helps them to manage their stress. It might help. It might have helped them to finish papers when they were in college. You know, it's been their friend for a long time, but it, you know, it's a friend that becomes an enemy. You know, in the white book, it says, you know, the medicine became the poison. Right, the very thing that I was trying to use in order to manage my life has made my life unmanageable, and I can't live that way anymore. I can't live with that anymore. You know, another perspective on grief is a therapist said this to me once that grief is love with nowhere to go. You know, grief is love with nowhere to go. Like when we lose people. There was somebody that we used to love. There was somebody that we used to confide in. There was somebody that we used to turn to. And and now our love just doesn't have any place to go. And because of the pain that's associated with that loss, we can be reluctant to really entrust our heart to another person. But as I said, grief is necessary because it makes room for new relationships. 
you know, it makes room for new relationships. And, and I really learned something about this. I was reflecting on words from a therapist friend of mine who works with a lot of priests. And, and he said that a lot of priests who struggle with unchastity at the root of their struggle is unresolved grief about their celibacy. And that used to be something that I thought was kind of a weird thing when our seminary formators would say something like, you have to grieve your celibacy. And, and I was just like, you have to grieve like your celibacy. I'm fine. And, um, but I started to have better perspective on what he meant. A couple of years ago, I went on vacation with a friend of mine and his family. And in uh, this particular family, um, there was like the parents and then their children, their adult children, and then their adult children's children, right? So three generations around this trip and, and the middle generation were all people that I knew as high school students. And, uh, and now I see them with their families and, uh, and I'm watching all these little children run around and, and I'm watching a dad look into his son's face and, and see his own face reflected back at him. And I, I remember the beauty of that striking me but also the reality that I would never have that in my own life, that, that I'll never look into the face of someone and see my own face looking back at me. And I have an amazing life as a priest. I have an amazing life. But that's something that I've said no to that I'm never gonna have. And I remember driving away from that vacation and thinking about that and, and thinking about all the what ifs, you know, like what if I would have married my high school girlfriend? What would my kids look like? What would our kids look like? What would that, what would that be like to be, have a father, to be a father of a son and to be able to mentor somebody and grow them? And, and as I was reflecting on that, I felt this resentment building in my heart because I would never have that. And then about a year later, I was really focused on grief and, uh, and I was with my brother and the same dynamic, it was Christmas and I was watching him and my niece as they were playing together and looking at her face and seeing aspects of his own face being reflected back. And I remember feeling that is so beautiful and I'm never gonna have that and saying to myself, I'm just grieving. I, I just need to grieve that. And I just let myself feel the sadness of it. And very shortly, very shortly, I was filled with an incredible joy and an incredible happiness which was a share in my brother's happiness and, and a gratefulness that I get to be part of his family and a gratefulness that I get to watch my nieces grow up. And, and, um, and it was a kind of joy that I hadn't really experienced before. Grief makes room for new relationships makes room for new relationships. It makes room for us to do something different. And, and so in step one, we made an inventory of our lives and we looked at our unmanageability of our life and the fact that, that we're really stuck. And, and like that man at the pool of Bethesda, like I have no one to help me and I'm not managing my life by myself. Like this is not working for me. And when we realize that, there's a lot of things that we need to grieve <clears throat> because in many ways, our addictive behavior has become God in our life. And, and so, so what we really are trying to do is make room for a new kind of relationship with God. Right? And so blessed are those who mourn kind of fits in between steps one and two, that realization that we're powerless and that our lives are unmanageable. And step two, when we come to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And, and this is one way of working. Step two is, is to make an inventory with four columns. In the, in the first column, we think about who's a powerful person in my life. You know, and, and somebody might say, well, um, you know, my, 
my father was a powerful person in my life. Okay, what did they do? Right? What did they do? Um, and they might say something like, you know, my father never praised me unless I had done something well. The only time he ever gave me affirmation was when I got all A's on my report card. And even when he did that, he always pointed out what I did wrong. You know, like you got an A minus there, you could have gotten an A. What happened? What did I come to believe about God? I came to believe that about God that God is the same way, that God only is happy with me when I perform for him. That I have to be perfect in order for him to love me. And that he always focuses on my faults rather than delighting in me from the beginning. And what I choose to believe now or what I believe now is that like I have a merciful God who delights in me simply for who I am. That that he always loves me. And even as he calls me to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. He continues to look at me with love. He continues to look at me with mercy. You know, and the focus on that love and mercy might come in meditating on our Lord's baptism and listening to the words of the Father as he says, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. But as we're, we're focusing on this second beatitude and second step today, I want to walk through kind of a meditation starter for these steps, looking at Mark chapter 10 and the story of the rich young man. This is 10, 17 through 22. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up, knelt down before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus answered him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. He replied and said to him, Teacher, all of these I have observed from my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You are lacking in one thing. Go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At that statement, his face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. And so a couple of points for meditation from that gospel reading that there's a desire in the rich young man to follow our Lord more completely. And yet he's still very performance oriented. What do I have to do to, to attain eternal life? Like, what do I have to do? And how many times have we asked that same question? Like, what do I have to do to be free? People in recovery rooms say things like, well, you have to surrender your heart. Okay, that's nice. But what do I have to do to be free? <laughs> what do I do to surrender my heart? And our Lord responds and tells him to keep the commandments. And then he asks for something more. He says, I, I do, I'm doing all those things. And our Lord looked at him and loved him. And what's that like when our Lord looks at you and loves you? What are his eyes like? What's his countenance like? He looked at him and loved him. 
And his loving look extends an invitation to something more. It extends an invitation to a deeper relationship with himself. And he says to him, go sell everything you have and come follow me. You have to say no to some things in order to give me a more complete yes. You have to say no to some things to say yes to me. Go sell what you have. And the rich young man goes away sad because he has many possessions. And we never hear what happens to him. We never hear that he went, dealt with his grief and went back to our Lord. Or did he just not follow our Lord and choose his possessions over our Lord? And we can often find ourselves, you know, on this cusp of between steps one and two where I know I need help, but I'm not sure I'm willing to do what it takes. And we find ourselves in the place of the rich young man. But what we can draw from that is to enter into that experience of sadness because it is sad. Maybe he has to sell a herd of animals. Maybe he has to sell property. Maybe he just has lots of nice clothes and he wants to have lots of nice clothes. Who knows? But he's going to have to give all that up in order to respond to the loving invitation of our Lord. And what are the things that our Lord is asking us to give up? What are the things our Lord is asking us to give up? And, and there's a certain sadness in that. And, and it's okay to experience that sadness with him. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And the things that we have to mourn might be our addiction, our time. The kind of affirmation that we got from our fantasy life. certain friendships. Some people have to give up YouTube altogether because YouTube is always a trigger for them. Giving up Facebook. Giving up control over our own life and over our destiny. Giving up the idea that I'm strong enough to beat this. Those are all things that that need to be mourned. One of the exercises that um, that's recommended is to write a letter to your addict. And the letter to the addict it's kind of like a breakup letter and it, there's sadness in it and, and it's acknowledging all the things that your addiction did for you. Thank you for helping me get through my life. Help, thank you for helping me get through my parents' divorce. Thank you for helping me get through finals in college. But I don't need you anymore. And you haven't actually been a good friend to me. And so I'm breaking up with you. So I'm leaving you. So I'm leaving you behind. It's kind of a process of mourning. And as we leave that behind, it creates space to experience something new with Jesus, to experience something new with him. When we do our step two inventories, we talked about what we used to think about God and what we believe about God now. So I have to mourn and grieve what I used to think was true to make space for the real truth, for the real person who is the truth.
And so I invite you to <clears throat> spend some time with this passage as you're preparing for step two, as you're continuing to work your recovery, maybe you're revisiting that place in your recovery. If you're not in recovery and you just want to enter more deeply into the Beatitudes to, to do all the same work, and experience the blessing that comes to those who mourn because they will be comforted because our Lord's love is greater than all those things. As he looked at him, he loved him. As he looked at him, he loved him. And he is the one that can bring order where there's disorder, who can bring peace where there's chaos, who can bring integrity to our hearts, our relationships, and our lives.